أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تبارك وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Uh, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, according to the Islamic way, I have to greet you saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I have the pleasure to be here tonight to chair that meeting. <coughs> <coughs> and to attend, to learn, to be educated by the two great scholars in Christianity. I'm not going to introduce them to you. I will leave that to our brother, Dr. Jamal Badawi. Uh, my intention now is to call upon uh, Sheikh Ahmed Amr, a reader, a reciter of the Holy Quran. Uh, he is one of the best in Egypt, famous in the whole Muslim world. Uh, he will start or begin this meeting as a custom in Islam is to start our meetings with a recitation from the Holy Quran. So we will listen to him, uh, and we, I hope all of you will enjoy the reading. Sheikh Ahmad Amr. I seek refuge with Allah from the accursed devil. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Yes, Aluka Ahlul Kitabi Antunazi. The people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, ask thee, O Muhammad, to cause a book to be sent to them from heaven. فقد سألوا موسى أكبر Indeed, they asked Moses for an even greater miracle. For they said, show us God in public, face to face. فقالوا أرنا الله جهرة For they said, show us God in public. But they were dazed for the presumption with thunder and lightning. Yet they worshipped the car, the golden car. Even after clear signs had come to them, even so we forgave them. Even so, we forgave them and gave Moses manifest proofs of authority. And for the covenant, we raised over them the towering height of Mount Sinai. And on another occasion, we said, enter the gate in humility. We said, enter the gate with humility. And once again, we commanded them, 
transgress not in the matter of the Sabbath. We commanded them, transgress not in the matter of the Sabbath. And we took from them a solemn covenant. They have incurred divine displeasure in that they broke the covenant, that they rejected the signs of God. That they rejected the signs of God, that they slew the messengers in defiance of right. That they slew the messengers in defiance of right, that they said, our hearts are the wrappings which preserve God's word. We need no more. Nay, God had set the seal on their hearts for their blasphemy. Little is it, they believe. That they rejected faith, that they uttered against Mary a grave false charge. That they said, in boast, we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. That they said in boast, we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. Those who differ therein are full of doubts. With no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety, they killed him not. Nay, God raised him up to himself. Nay, God raised him up to himself. 
and God is exalted in power wise. Holy Quran, chapter 4, verses 153 to 158. Verily, Allah, the exalted in might, the wise, has spoken the truth. Sadaqallahu uh, al-Azim. Brothers and sisters, uh, let me say a few words to acquaint you with the debate. Uh, is it of a recent time or it goes back to the history? In the early history of Islam, there is something that happened like that. Uh, if it is not a debate between two scholars, it was in literature. It started in the Abbasid time, the Abbasid Caliphate. Some of our brothers, uh, the Christian, the monk, wrote something uh, in a form of a question and answer, saying, uh, teaching the Christians uh, how to answer the Muslims and how to put question to them. Uh, someone took, it, took that up. For example, Al-Ghazali uh, took that up and wrote something about Christianity. It was an essay, a small paper written about uh, refuting the questions of the uh, missionaries and the monks or replying them. Uh, someone after Al-Ghazali took it in a large way in a extensive studies. We can read, for example, uh, Al-Milal wa nahal written by uh, Ibn Hazm. He spoke or he discussed this matter in a full length and uh, intellectually it is so difficult for us uh, for uh, unless we are scholars in Christianity uh, it is difficult because Ahmed Ibn has tried his best to philosophize the matter and put it in a rational base uh, also Ibn Taymiyyah took the matter uh, up and spoke about Christianity refuting or answering the questions brought by the monks and the missionaries he has a book by name Al Jawab al Sahih, Liman Baddala Deen al Masih, the right answer for those who uh, altered the uh, Christian uh, religion, and so on. Up in our time, even uh, Sheikh Rahmatullah al Hindi uh, met the missionaries in India and he stood against the tide of missionaries. And he has a book by name Izhar al Haq, which is considered as a source, the main source for, uh, for us now to debate or to know something about Christianity. I know that a lot of literature was written uh, about this subject, but we didn't attend. When we read that, oh, it is something uh, rational things and uh, so and so, but to attend, it is myself, I, if I so so, if I say so, it is myself, I never attend a debate between two gigantic people uh, scholars in Christianity to debate with each other. I know that we are not here to score points or to try to convert each other, but we want to, to present Islam in a, in a, in a right form. Uh, Islam in the West was, is, and still uh, misunderstood. When we say that is our attitude towards Jesus, it doesn't mean that we are condemning Christianity or we are refuting Christianity, but we are saying that is that is our attitude to, towards Christianity and what Islam is to show our brothers here in the West and in America what Islam is and to come to understanding, to create some harmony because when we understand each other religion, we will understand each other, we will come together, we will be, we will mitigate the gap between uh, what uh, sometimes some vested interested people create some disharmony enmity between the two religions they are benefited by that what we are trying to do now is to mitigate the gap between Muslims and the Christianity and to create some harmony between Muslims and the Christians according to the Holy Quran because you know that the Holy Quran the nearest people of the book Two, uh, two Muslims are the Christians. That is stated in the Holy Quran. So we are trying to fulfill that and to create that bridge to come together. And our scholars, of course, they will speak intellectually. I am sure that uh, we may miss or we may misunderstand 
So if you have any doubt, if you have any misunderstanding, there will be a time for questions to clarify all what is said, all what misunderstood, and it will be given to you to ask all of them. Now, I'm not going to talk anymore, but I'll ask our Gamal Badawi, Dr. Gamal Badawi, to introduce the speakers, and uh, you will uh, enjoy that talk and this discussion. Thank you. All grace is due to Allah, creator and cherisher of the universe, and may his peace and blessing be upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and upon all prophets who preceded him in history. I greet you with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace and blessing of Allah, the, the creator, be upon you all. It is indeed a welcome opportunity that we meet together this evening in order to hear a Christian perspective and a Muslim perspective about the topic, was Jesus, peace be upon him, crucified. The organizers of this function suggested that since a good number of our fellow Christians may not be totally familiar with Islam as understood by Muslims, I was requested to include a few minutes, very few minutes hopefully, uh, by way of clarification of the term Islam at least. The term Islam comes from an Arabic root which denotes peace and submission. Put together, Islam simply means peace through submission to the will of the Creator. To Allah. A comment on both words, peace and submission. When we speak about peace, we speak about, above all, peace with Allah, the Creator, peace with oneself, the certitude, the confidence, the tranquility resulting from believing in the Creator, and as a result, it would achieve, hopefully, peace with other human beings and peace with the universe and environment in which we live. The word submission means conscious, trusting and loving submission to the will of the Creator, receiving His guidance and accepting His grace. According to the Quran, Islam defined as such in this generic meaning was the essence of the mission of all prophets and messengers throughout human history. The differences and problems that we find today among those quote-unquote followers of these messengers and prophets may result at times from the misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the nature and mission of their prophets or it could result also from the lack of commitment on the part of those who claim to follow Jesus or Muhammad, peace be upon them, but not to try to implement the teaching taught by those two giants in their lives. And as such, we can never evaluate a religion or faith by the action of those who claim to belong to it, but rather to evaluate those who claim to belong to any faith according to the standards of that faith, according to the authentic teaching by the great prophets of those of ways of life or faith I should say among many of the prophets who are mentioned in the Quran five are singled out as the greatest they are called in the Quran Ulul Azm the greatest and those with great perseverance and determination and these include prophet Noah Abraham Moses Jesus and Muhammad may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon them all Indeed, a prerequisite for a Muslim to be a Muslim is to believe in, respect, and love all of these prophets who are regarded as brothers in the path of Allah, in the path of obedience and commitment of our entire life to His will. 
And as Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned as one of the greatest five, it might be suitable to make a comment here that his name and his mission and various aspects about him appear in numerous surahs, quote unquote, chapter in the Quran. Indeed, one of the surahs or chapters in the Quran takes its name after the name of Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him. It's called Surah Maryam, the Surah of Mary, and its number in the chronology of the Quran is 19. Now, while Muslims and Christians do differ, and we should make the point clear, do differ on the issue of divinity attributed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and while they differ also on the issue of crucifixion, whether it happened, what the meaning of it is, even if it happened, what significance really does it have? I believe there is still an area of common ground that we may start from, that both Muslims and Christians believe in, respect, and love Jesus, peace be upon him. He is called in the Quran a prophet, messenger, messiah, anointed or Messiah. He is described in a very tender way, especially in this surah number 19, as one who is blessed in this life and the hereafter and among those who are nearest to Allah, the Creator. I hope that while we all understand that interreligious understanding and dialogues might involve varying degrees of emotions, I do hope, however, that all of us here, belonging to Islam, Christianity, or other ways of life for that matter, approach tonight's evening with a loving atmosphere and with an open heart and open mind. It is my privilege and honor to present to you the first speaker, Professor Floyd Clark. Professor Clark is of the Philippi Church of Christ in Creswell, in the United States. He is a professor emeritus of the Johnson Bible College in Knoxville, Tennessee. Presently, he travels throughout the world looking after the church groups which belong to his organization uh, and the various mission services organization. And he is at present based in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, professor Clark will be speaking for 15 minutes. Professor Clark. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, my good friend, uh, Hamadidat, distinguished guests and friends. I am so grateful to be here and to uh, participate in this most unusual dialogue. First, may I introduce to you some of my uh, people. Uh, first of all, my wife, Clara, down here in front, Clara Clark. Um, We are only married uh, five months, and we spent part of our honeymoon in Durban and visited with Ahmed and his family and uh, treasure those moments. On me, with me on the platform also is Brother Richard Bourne, my host uh, this week and a former a graduate, uh, a former student of mine, a graduate of our school and now at work here in London with the uh, uh, Barrett uh, Church of Christ in Hendon, uh, Brother Richard Bourne. Uh, somewhere around here is the fellow that got this all started uh, back in 1962. One of my other students was at work in South Africa and uh, uh, succeeded in uh, getting Brother Didat to agree to a public discussion over some of the things which he had said. 
And uh, thus, this man got launched into a ministry that has carried him worldwide. Al Hamilton himself has been involved in mission work all the way from South Africa to uh, Papua New Guinea, and he and his wife are here somewhere. Uh, Annette. He's lost as usual. <laughs> okay, Al. So delighted to have Al with us. When this came up, I said, you got me into this. You got to be here tonight. Other members and friends, we have Dr. Weedman and his family. Uh, Dr. Weedman is not only a former student, but a, <clears throat> a fellow professor at Johnson Bible College, now dean at Lincoln Christian College in Lincoln, Illinois, and uh, here for a summer term teaching in, uh, in uh, our college here in, in, in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> uh, may we go to the Lord in prayer, please. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the tone that has already been set in this meeting and for the earnest words of these who have spoken to the situation. And uh, Lord, I'm grateful that others beside myself are interested in building bridges between these people that are so uh, numerous of these two great faiths. And we pray tonight that uh, we shall be able to communicate and to share and that uh, no one will go home this evening without having been profited by these discussions. May your grace attend us, for we pray in the name of our Lord and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> My uh, preparation for this discussion, as I've already intimated, started many years ago when Al succeeded in getting Brother Ahmed to agree to a public discussion he wrote me and said, you're going to have to come down and engage in this discussion. And I made preparations to do so, and they were held uh, in uh, uh, South Africa in 1963, uh, one in the uh, City Hall in Johannesburg and one in the City Hall in Durban. But by the time those discussions came around, I was hindered by responsibilities at uh, uh, Johnson Bible College, and I sent uh, my colleague, Dr. Searle Simpkins, and uh, he reported to us later that he had a very respectful hearing uh, from uh, all of the people on both occasions. Uh, I was not able personally to meet Ahmed and uh, exchange uh, views with him until two years ago when uh, I was able to visit Durban and uh, he invited me out to his home and we spent some 14 hours in rather vigorous and often loud discussions. Uh, I then was able this uh, past March and April to uh, return to Durban and my wife and I were on three different occasions entertained in the Didat home, and uh, my wife enjoyed the hospitality of Mrs. Uh, Didat as well. I, uh, I want everyone to understand that I do not come here to uh, uh, engage in some sort of contest to ridicule my friend or make problems for him. I do not come as an enemy, but as a friend, and I value his friendship very highly. <clears throat> uh, before uh, we begin, and I hesitate to do this, not knowing exactly how my words will be taken, but I feel obliged, both for Ahmed and myself, uh, to, rem uh, to make a remark about what happened last Wednesday night to us he and myself both here at the Central Mosque in uh, London. I think you were very unkind to my friend because uh, you gave him an assignment. He said he had never had opportunity to prepare to do. And when uh, he attempted to speak to the subject and then turned to other matters, somebody sent a note uh, to him while he was still speaking to get back to the subject. 
I uh, think that was most unkind to treat a guest like that. And uh, I was also uh, a little bit uh, uh, concerned because you asked me to occupy the uh, speaker's table along with Brother Ahmed, but uh, you didn't give me an opportunity either to greet the audience or to speak uh, a word on this subject. And it just so happens that this particular subject uh, that was assigned to Ahmed has been the one to which I have devoted my attention for these last 48 years. Ahmed seemed to have a little difficulty, maybe I misunderstood him, in finding much uh, in the Koran on this subject, but uh, I have found in the Bible, you know, so many things that speak about the relation of God and man. I feel if you had let me have a chance, I could have said something to help my friend out. Please don't do me that way again, and I will appreciate it. <clears throat> the subject, as you have already heard and know for this assignment, to which we are each speaking is, was Jesus Christ crucified? And in order to answer that question, I think we understand we'll have to ask at least two more questions. First of all, what is crucifixion? What does it mean when it says Jesus was crucified? And secondly, uh, what uh, or who is this person called Jesus Christ, of whom we are discussing this evening? The uh, practice of crucifixion uh, uh, is defined in Webster's New World Dictionary as the uh, execution by nailing or binding a person to a cross and then leaving this person to die of exposure. In the case of Jesus, the gospel record is clear. He was not just fastened. Uh, he was nailed both through his hands and his feet. The Romans, I'm sure you understand, are the ones who perfected this particular form of execution in order to uh, terrorize the slaves of the Roman world upon whom they depended for all of their works. The Romans had uh, uh, traveled across the world with this uh, terrifying war machine of theirs that trampled over all the nations of the world and reduced most men to slavery. The record indicates that in Jesus' time, nine out of ten men in the Roman world were slaves. And the historians in Rome record the fact that Rome lived in daily fear of a slave uprising. With so many slaves, and some of them far more intelligent than their masters and better educated, these people uh, were constantly threatened by the fact that the slaves might revolt. And so they began almost a universal practice of uh, taking uh, slaves and making object lessons of them by crucifying them in uh, prominent places where all could be in fear. In the uh, method of execution by crucifixion. The uh, person is uh, nailed uh, to a bar through the small parts of his uh, recession in the wrist so that the nails would not strip out through the hands. And uh, this bar to which he is nailed is then raised up and dropped onto a post uh, and uh, this post probably already in place as the Romans uh, practiced execution by crucifixion everywhere. And uh, then the person's feet were pulled up against the wood of the post and one nail driven through the ankles of each foot into the wood. But uh, fixing him in a crouching position where there could be some movement up and down on the cross, 
and uh, the person would not then immediately die of suffocation. For death uh, on the cross ultimately ended in suffocation when the body weakened by the uh, loss of blood and the excruciating pain and the exposure would get uh, ultimately so weak that the person could no longer force the body up and release the air that was trapped in the lungs and then get another breath of air. The, uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, folk like Jesus, where they apparently were interested in hastening the death of the person crucified, the Romans would uh, whip uh, the victim before the time of the crucifixion. And uh, these uh, uh, terrible whips that they used would cut the back and open up the blood vessels in the individual and weaken him and hasten his death. And as you know, Jesus was whipped uh, before he was crucified. Of course, if the Romans at any one time wanted to end the life of a person, it was easily done. Whenever they were prepared for the person to die, they could just go and break his legs, and then he could no longer push himself up and get the air, and in a few moments he would be suffocated to death. In the case of Jesus, it is quite clear that uh, when they crucified him, they flogged him, and then they nailed him to the cross, and uh, then uh, for these six hours, he was uh, fastened there to the cross by the nails. The second part of the question tonight has to do with, now, who is this Jesus Christ who was crucified? We have already heard that he is one of the prophets uh, and one to be revered. We certainly concur in that uh, statement already made this evening. Let's look, however, in more detail as to what the Bible has to say about this one called Jesus the Christ. The Gospel says that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was a mighty worker of miracles, that he was a great teacher and prophet. And uh, as you've already heard, and my friend Ahmed had already told me, I understand the Quran does teach you that uh, you are to believe such things about uh, Jesus called the Christ. But uh, there is more in the scripture about him. Mary was told to call him Yeshua, or in the English, Jesus, uh, a uh, transliteration of the Hebrew word, which in the verb form means to save. And Mary was told by the angel to name him Savior, for the angel said he would save his people from their sins. Now the word Christ comes not from the Hebrew but from the Greek, as Greek was the common language of the day, and it is the language in which the New Testament scriptures are written. The uh, word Christ means anointed. And uh, when Jesus asked his apostles whom they thought him to be, uh, Peter responded by saying, you are the Christ. This word uh, signifies someone who has been put in a place of authority and anointed uh, as the installation process to that office. The Jews of Old Testament times anointed uh, prophets and priests and kings before they were installed in office. And when Peter says then of Jesus that he is the Christ, he has to mean at least that in Peter's mind he is the prophet, he is the priest, he is the king. 
In uh, John 8, 46, when the temple authorities were sent to arrest Jesus and they returned without him, the uh, priests wanted to know why, and they said, Never man so speak as this man speaks. His enemies recognized that certainly Jesus was a prophet and speaking with great uh, power. Jesus himself said of his own speech, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. As to his being priest, we are told in the Hebrew letter that Jesus was made a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And as to being king, you well know that this was the thing that got him crucified because uh, when Pilate asked him, are you king? And he said, yes, I'm king. And when he was crucified, Pilate had written in the three languages of the people, the king of the Jews. So his enemies and the authorities recognized that Jesus was claiming to be some kind of king. And so when we ask, who is this Jesus Christ, we have to think in terms of him as a prophet, as a high priest, and as a king. When Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, the Spirit, uh, it says, uh, uh, drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And some 40 days later, when he returned, John, the man who had immersed him, pointed him out and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And that term has to mean something to the Muslim people as you uh, consider the necessity of a sacrifice among your own people. Uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But we cannot understand uh, Jesus apart from his mission, which he came to fulfill. And we will need to take a look at his times if we're to understand that. The leaders of the world at the beginning of the Christian era were for the most part skeptical about God. If there was a God, he was not interested in man, especially the poor man. The only help that any man could expect was that which he found at the end of each of his wrists. His own hand or his own head would have to help him, no one else would. The world's philosophers had searched for centuries for meaning to life and had come up with nothing better than to eat and drink, for tomorrow we die or the most common practice uh, leading to suicide which said don't worry about anything because every vein in the body is a way out. All the while, the God of heaven has been revealing himself to the world by the things which he had made. Anywhere a man chose to look, he could find evidence of God's supreme power and intelligence. But men refuse to recognize God or give him credit. Rather, they chose to believe that the demons in rocks and trees had power over the universe. With their own hands, they made images of all kinds of things in the hope that the uh, powers in these images would give to their owners the means of controlling the world to their own purposes. Since man rejected the knowledge of the God of heaven, God withdrew the light of reason from these people. And men became creatures enslaved to vile passions, interested only in working something shameful and disgraceful to their own bodies. 
to such a world in the reign of the Roman Caesar Tiberius, Jesus came preaching. The uh, now 30 years of age, Jesus came to his home province of Galilee preaching in the Hebrew synagogues and declaring to all who would listen that the kingdom of God had arrived and men should now repent and believe the gospel. The gospel as defined by the Bible is the good news that God does not want any person to be lost but to, for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that God loved man, he did not hate man, but God loved man. And so he was going to provide a way for man to be rescued from his own destruction. If this was going to happen, men, however, were going to have to change their mind because they were possessed with this idea that there was no deity really in charge but the devils themselves. And uh, they had to placate those devils somehow if they would survive in this world. And so Jesus had to demonstrate, not just by word but by his life, that God is still in charge, God is still in control, and God intends that man have the power to overcome Satan and be the victor in this world and in this life. Now to do that, of course, he had to counter the lies of the, the wise people of the day and tell men the truth, even as we have that problem today. And surely we can join in that effort to convince the world of our time that this world did not just happen, it just did not come by some sort of uh, easy process, but that God is the creator and sustainer of our universe, and to him we will all one day give an account. John says in the preface of his gospel, grace and truth became, came into being, arrived for the first time by Jesus Christ. Those are important statements. Up until Jesus came, nobody gave anybody favor. It was thought to be cowardice. It was thought to be almost criminal to be kind or forgiving to anyone. It was a case of a uh, every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. But Jesus came to explain about God's grace and to show how that grace could redeem man from the miseries into which he had fallen. But of course he had to tell the truth, the truth about God and his world and about man and all the things that he was needing. To gain attention, he had to demonstrate that he himself uh, had the power of God. And so, as you know and as you believe, he performed all sorts of miracles that still has the world talking. He multiplied, for instance, the boys' lunch and fed 5,000 men besides women and children. He stilled the storm by command and the wind stopped and the waves were quieted. He healed the sick. It didn't matter how badly sick. He restored lepers to health. He gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raised the dead, and all these things. He was trying to tell us that God is good. He's not bad. He's not a devil of some kind interested in destroying us all. God is good. And God is wanting to prepare a good world for us, not only here, but in the world to come. On one occasion, as you may know if you've read the gospel, Jesus brought a man back to life who had been dead four days. The Jews did not embalm. They buried, therefore, ordinarily the same day by winding the body with the cloth and uh, 
uh, putting in whatever spices they could afford. On the occasion that we read in John 11 about this work of Christ, uh, Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, had sent word to him that his friend Lazarus, their brother, was sick. But the servants could not locate Jesus right away, and by the time he arrived, Lazarus was in the tomb four days already. Jesus asked the girls to take him out to the burial place, and they did with many of the townspeople following. At the tomb site, he asked the sisters to have the stone removed, and they objected, saying that he's dead already, there will be bad odor. But Jesus insisted, and they moved the stone. Then standing there with the odors coming out of the dead body from within, Jesus uh, spoke first to his heavenly Father, saying, Father, I know that you hear me at all times, but because of the people standing here, I say this, that they may believe that you have sent me. And then uh, kneeling down, uh, no doubt, and shouting into the uh, door of the tomb, he said, Lazarus, outside, here! <laughs> and uh, to the amazement of the bystanders, a body came out of the opening of the cave an unseen hand set that man on his feet, and Jesus said to the sisters, Loose him and let him go. Parable for our times. I wonder if Jesus isn't asking a lot of us to loose a lot of people and let them go that Satan has bound in all sorts of things. The one, however, who could do this could still not convince his enemies he had the right to such powers. And, of course, that is still true today. Uh, Brother Ahmed, I've been trying to say we will never accomplish anything by arguments. If we're going to accomplish anything in learning the truth, it has to be by brotherhood and goodwill and the effort honestly to listen to one another. But you know, other people have a different way toward that, and it was in Jesus' day. And so in the ultimate, he had to die himself and demonstrate that he had the power that was the mighty power which would make it impossible really for anyone to destroy him unless he consented to it. Jesus said, you know, that uh, no one is going to kill me. He said, I'm going to lay down my life myself, and if I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it again. The uh, practice among the Christians that sometimes is called the Eucharist or the Holy Communion is a celebration of the meaning of what Jesus was trying to say. For on the Lord's Day, when Christians take a bit of bread and break it and then eat it, they are remembering something Jesus told his disciples that night in the upper room trying to get them ready for the moment when he would be gone and to remind them that if he left, he would certainly be back. He took some bread, and uh, Brother Ahmed has served me some of that bread at his table, and it's better uh, he didn't bring me some tonight or I'd used it here. Uh, <clears throat> he took this bread and broke it and gave to them and said, Now this is my body. You eat this in remembrance of me. And the Christians since that time have remembered what happened that moment on the cross when it was all finished and Jesus had done everything the prophecies said he must do 
Suddenly he yelled big and strong from the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in a moment he was gone. And every Lord's Day, as I with my brothers break bread, I remember that moment because he said, Remember me. Remember me how in that I gave my life. It was broken and I was gone. But just as quickly I'll be back. Even as your prophets tell you to believe that our Lord Jesus is to return, and in the climax of the events of the world of this time to serve in judgment in the final things in our world. But also this is related to another Christian practice you may not understand. We Christians, as you well understand, have been our worst enemies. Uh, divided in so many ways, saying so many contradictory things, you are not to be uh, uh, blamed if you do not understand what Christians are supposed to believe. But Jesus came to begin something when he came to John there at the Jordan and uh, was baptized of J John in the Jordan, and the heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended, and God claimed him as his special son. And uh, Jesus then said in parting with his disciples that they were to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and immerse people into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach all that he had commanded. You see, when the Christian obeys that command, he is demonstrating his belief that Jesus was, uh, Jesus surrendered up his life, he was buried, he was raised the third day, and he is coming again. Every time someone is baptized, this is the demonstration. This person believes that just as Jesus died, he can die to his sins just as Jesus was buried in the tomb. He can have his sins buried just as Jesus was raised. He can be raised free from his sins and receive of the Holy Spirit and live as God intends his people. So there are two points. If you want to understand, if you who are of the Muslim faith, the Islamic faith, want to understand Christians, you cannot understand them apart from these two celebrations, the breaking of the bread and the immersion in the water. <clears throat> uh, there is a part of this, Mr. Chairman, how am I doing? Are you going to call? How much time do I have here? Another 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Is he the moderator or you? <laughs> <laughs> You're timing me, are you? <laughs> okay. They say I have 15 minutes. Well, I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Jesus, as God's great witness in the world, was trying to tell us that God intends people to live a good life in this world. He said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. He said, of all the things which he did, greater things than these shall ye do because I go to the Father. Now, a friend, uh, those are promises we all need. All of us can feel that we are victimized by the circumstances of life from time to time, and all of us need the assurance that when we talk to God, we're not just talking into a phone when there's no one else on the other end of the line. The Christian is trying to demonstrate, and should, and if he's a genuine Christian, he does, that the mighty power of God comes in associated with the name of Jesus Christ because he said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
When he was chiding his apostles one time for their small faith, he said, if you had faith like a little tiny grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move over there and it would move, and nothing, nothing shall be impossible to you. Now, are you interested in that promise? Surely, if Jesus is a prophet, he wouldn't make a promise like that and not plan to make it good. He said, if you ask, I promise you nothing, nothing shall be impossible to you. Now, I'm here as a physical demonstration to that promise. I should have been dead two years ago. Uh, and, of course, other times in the past. But I have survived, I'm convinced, because God has made this old man able to do what for him was the impossible, and tonight is one of those. I believe I am to remain in this world uh, as long as I can continue to demonstrate that when I pray, not because I'm good or anything, but when I pray God's will, things happen that have never happened before. Now, friends, we've got lots of miseries in our world that God wants to do something about. But God's answer to every problem in the world has always been someone who would believe him. Maybe I have time to tell the story of Moses, and I, I like this part of that story. Moses is one of your prophets as well as ours. You remember the time when Moses was trying to lead the people out of Egypt and uh, God was directing the way through the pillar of uh, fire by uh, night and the cloud by day and they got trapped down there along the Suez, along the uh, Red Sea between the mountains and the sea and uh, Pharaoh's army pursuing it looked like they were all boxed in and Moses in desperation fell down and uh, cried out to the Lord, why were there no good places in Egypt for us to die? Did you have to bring us out here into this miserable place? And God said to Moses, get up. Get your people out. Tell them to move out. And he said, you take that stick you have in your hand and you go down there to that water and divide the water. In the Greek translation of that Hebrew scripture, translated some 200 years before the time of for Christ, the word says rip or tear. I like that picture. God commands that old 80-year-old man. You feel like you're 80 tonight, Ahmed? He looks a little tired. You haven't treated him well this week. Please let him live a little longer. Be kind to him. I, I relate a little bit to this old man, 80 years old, with all this responsibility, and he's telling him, take your stick and go down there and tear up that water. And he did it. He shouted to the people, come on, move out, move out, move out, move out. And he went down there and he took his stick and he wailed at that water and the water ran away from him and piled up on both sides and the people went through on dry land. I've been in Africa recently trying to tell our African people God doesn't have to have millions and millions and millions of dollars to do something for you. When you're prepared to put to use what stick or whatever it is that is in your hand, God can make you change your world. And that's what our Lord came to do. It is with reason that history divides before Christ and after Christ. Because he started something that has made possible influences that have completely altered the world 
and brought joy and happiness and peace such as we could never imagine. I uh, visited with my friend Ahmed two years ago, and at the end of these hours and hours of discussion, I said, now I understand you tell me that you believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin, that he performed these miracles, that he was God's prophet. I said, why don't you follow him? And Ahmed said, I do. And I said, no, uh, you don't, really. For Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and you have not been baptized. I hope I can see the day when you and he can understand that you people from the Muslim faith can obey Jesus Christ not to join the confusion in the denominational world, but to have all the truth that Jesus has for you. If in spite of all the problems that have been raised, you can understand that you can believe our Lord and he wants to lead you. I understand that you men 34 times a day, I believe it is, say in the midst of your prayers to God, show us the straight path. Remember Jesus, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by me. And he said, I am the way and the resurrection. I ask sincerely, I want to be your friend. I'm not asking as an enemy. I am not trying to threaten you. I am asking you to weigh these words and uh, understand that Jesus wants to direct your path. Uh, thank you. I don't need that five minutes. I believe I'm finished right now. Ahmed, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, but I have one, I have, uh, one word to say. Uh, when we were in the Islamic Culture Center, we have no idea whatsoever that Dr. Clark is, will be there. And the subject we were talking, we were uh, selecting to talk about, I don't think it was in, has no any relevance to Dr. Clark to talk about. If we don't invite him to give a talk, uh, if we, it appears that we don't entertain him nicely. I'm very sorry for that. I apologize it to him. But uh, as a matter of fact, we had no idea that he will attend the meeting. And after the meeting, uh, it was very short time, and we have to go for our prayer. So we are very sorry. Time was limited, so limited. So that's why we even... Uh, didn't ask all, uh, didn't answer all the questions anyhow uh, we are happy to hear that uh, uh, sermon and the vivid picture we heard about the crucifixion of Jesus I think it will live in our memory for a long time and now I'll invite ask our brother Jamal to introduce Dr. Bessa Didat Assalamu alaikum. Uh, before introducing our second speaker, just a little announcement that those uh, brothers or sisters who did not have their Asr prayers, you should try to find any place and do it wherever you can because there will be no break since the time is really at a premium. Uh, our second speaker is Mr. Ahmed Didat. Mr. Didat is a world renowned a Muslim scholar and writer. He developed special interest in comparative religion and wrote about 25 works on the subject. Mr. Didat is a well-traveled person who participated in lectures, seminars, and dialogues in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, 
in the U.S. Mr. Didat also heads a well-known uh, charitable organization in Durban, South Africa. This organization makes available, among other things, free literature in the form of books, uh, cassette tapes, and audiovisual tapes, uh, and make that available throughout the world. Uh, the format for tonight would be for the 50 minutes that Professor Clark has taken. Uh, Mr. Didat will be speaking for 60 minutes, and the other 10 minutes due to Professor Clark will be taken after Mr. Didat. Mr. Didat. I, uh, I would like to bring your attention the uh, very well-taken remark made by uh, Sheikh Zahran, the chairman of the conference in the beginning, that we are not meeting here for any particular context, contest, nor for any political demonstration. I think it, is, it behooves all of us, Muslims and Christian fellows and others, to concentrate on rational thinking, and trying to understand what the speakers are saying without uh, expressing emotions in this form. I appreciate that and I would demand it. Mr. Chairman, if you will allow me, I would like my brothers and sisters all to stand up for a second and Take a deep breath, please. please. Take a deep breath, loosen your limbs, loosen your limbs before you sit down. So, you know, you'll be more relaxed when I get started. Take a deep breath, yes. Marshal. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان الزهوق وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خسارة صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and brethren on the subject of crucifixion, the Muslim's position is very clear. He is told in no uncertain terms in the Holy Quran which portions of uh, sections of those verses were recited by our beloved Qari. And I repeat for you from Surah Nisa, verse number 157, which gives us solution to this problem in a nutshell one verse it says wa qawlihim inna qatalna al-masihu isa ibn maryam rasulullah and they said in boast the jews they said in boast that we killed christ jesus the son of mary the apostle of god in answer to that allah says wa ma qataluhu that they didn't kill him nor did they crucify him but it was made to appear to them so that is what they thought they had done and those who dispute therein are full of doubts they have no certain knowledge they only follow conjecture guesswork fiction for a surety, they killed him not. Now I ask you, Mr. Chairman and brethren, can anyone could have been more explicit, more emphatic, more dogmatic in rectifying an idea than this? The idea of our Christian brethren that Christ died for the sins. He was crucified. I said, can anyone be more emphatic than this? Impossible. The only one who can afford to do that is God Almighty, the omnipotent, omniscient Lord of the universe. He is the only one. And the Muslim, in response to that, he says, 
Amanna Sadakna. We believe and we affirm. He needs no proof. The Muslim needs no proof. This is the book of God, and the book of God has stated the case fully one verse, completed the whole thing. But our Christian brethren, they would say, look, where did you get this from? This idea says in the Quran. Where does the Quran come from? We say, look, it was revealed by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Since they do not believe in the Quran, we are now forced to have recourse to their own book, as Allah commands us to do. He tells us that when people make claim, exaggerated claims, tell them, pull, tell them how to burhan them. So produce your evidence. In Kuntum Sadiqeen, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your certificate. And they have produced it. They have. What? The Holy Bible in 2,000 different languages. I can't imagine a person, an Arab or a Gujarati or a Bengali, Indonesian, whoever you are, they have a Bible in your language. So look, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. So well, let's have a look at the Bible. So there is a chapter in the Bible specially dedicated to the subject, the subject of the resurrection of Jesus. If there is no death, there is no resurrection. If there is no crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And that chapter happens to be in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In quite a few Bibles, the heading given to that chapter is the resurrection of Christ. In it, Paul, Saint Paul, in verse 3 he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 14, he said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. That's what he's telling the other Christians. That means we have nothing. If this thing didn't happen, that Christ died and he was resurrected, then everything is hot air, wind. The American would say garbage. Everything is garbage if this thing didn't happen. <laughs> then in verse number 35, Paul poses the question. He poses the, a rhetoric question. He's not asking you or me. He said, someone may rationally ask, how do the dead rise again? And, what, and with what kind of body will they come? And in verse 42, he answers. He answers his own question. Verse 43 of the same chapter. See, so it is sown, the dead body. It is sown, it is buried. It is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown, means buried, the dead body. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. And it is sown, buried, a physical body and it is raised a spiritual body. I would like to know if there's anybody here, you know, who needs a dictionary to understand that. It is sown, buried, a physical body, and it is raised a spiritual body. I'm asking, do you need a dictionary for that? Do you need a DD for that or a DDAT for that to explain to you? No. Simple statement. King's English or Queen's English from the authorized King James Version. Now, what Paul says about this resurrection, that it will be a spiritual body, he's only confirming what Jesus Christ had already said to his disciples, to the Jews. But Paul didn't have it before him because he was about the first person to start writing 
these epistles of his. And he wrote 14 different epistles, 14 different books of the New Testament, more than 50%. He didn't know. He didn't hear. He didn't read. But Jesus Christ had said the very same thing. We read that in the Gospel of St. Luke, St. Luke chapter 20, verse 36. The Jews came to Jesus. They were always coming to him with poses and riddles. They were trying to test him out, make a fool of him. Master, must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Master, this woman we found her in the, caught her in the act. What must we do to her? Master this and master that. They were always trying to put him to the test. Now they come to him with another riddle, a poser. Said, Master, Rabbi in the Hebrew language, there was a woman among us. And that woman had seven husbands. According to a Jewish practice, if one brother died and if he le leave, left no offspring, then the second brother takes her to wife. And when he fails, the third. And when he fails, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Seven guys had this one woman. But there was no problem because it was all one by one. Now they are asking Jesus that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her because they all had her here. So if you have her here, you want to have her there. That's the picture they're giving Jesus. Which guy is going to have her on the other side? Because seven guys will wake up simultaneously, all seven, one time. And when they wake up one time, they see this woman, everybody says, my wife, my dear, my darling, and there'll be a war in heaven between the seven brothers. Say, get away, it's mine. The other guys say, get away, it's mine. There'll be war in heaven between the seven brothers. So they want to know from Jesus which guy is going to have her on the other side. In answer to that, Jesus says, neither shall they die anymore. Meaning, once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body which has got its mortal needs. Food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, no Englishman left, no Pakistani left, no American left. Finish. So that body will be an immortal body. No food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest of the type that we know. For they are equal unto the angels. For they are equal unto the angels. Meaning that they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Such spirits. Luke chapter 20 verse 36. Paul says that the resurrected bodies will be spirits. Jesus says the resurrected bodies will be spirits. I say the resurrected bodies will be spirits. I want to find a single dissenting voice here in this great hall to say that they believe that the resurrected bodies will not be spiritualized, it will be physical resurrection. Before I proceed, I want to get 100% acceptance from each and every one of you that the resurrection will be spiritual as Paul says, it will be spiritual as Jesus says. Not this body. You all agree? Is there any dissenting voice? Yes? What do you say? Right, I will answer that. So we go to that upper room, as our brother has quoted. That's Luke chapter 24, verse 36. See, Jesus walks into that upper room. According to the scriptures, I'm only reading the Bible, what it says. I'm not reading the Quran. I don't say the Quran says this, the Quran says that. Or, you know, some Imam Ghazali said such and such a thing. Now, our brother quoted scripture. He quoted Luke chapter 24, verse 36. So I said, let's go to that to satisfy him. That the resurrected bodies is just the exact opposite what Paul said. What Jesus is telling you there is exact opposite. It's exact opposite of what Jesus told you. 
You see, Jesus walks into that upper room where they had the Last Supper. After his alleged crucifixion. And he goes in and he wishes his disciples Shalom Alaikum in Hebrew. In Arabic, Salam Alaikum. In English, peace be unto you. When he said, peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, the Arab and the Jew, you might have seen some of us performing. You know, we embrace one another, we kiss one another. The Jews did the same. So instead of embracing Jesus and kissing him, as the Jews and the Arabs do, they were terrified. I want to know why were they terrified. It's very unusual. When you meet your master, your ustad, your guru, whatever it is, why should you be terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. I'm only quoting. They thought he was a spirit. They thought. So I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? Did he look like a spirit? And in 40 years, no Christian with the name has told me yes, not one. I said, did he look like a spirit? This is no. I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? You will have your time at question time. At question time, you'll be given the opportunity. Uh, would you see, brothers, uh, there's a question time. Would you please? No, sir. Uh, be quiet, take me a bit, he finishes his talk, and you are free to ask him what you like. Uh, 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 my brother, I'm misunderstood. This was a rhetoric question. I wasn't asking you, I was only rhetorically speaking. So, I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? So the answer is that the disciples of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, they had heard, they had heard that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard that he had given up the ghost, in other words, he had died. They had heard that now he's dead and buried for three days. A man with such a reputation, you expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a person when you see, naturally you are terrified. It's a natural reaction. Because Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, at that they all forsook him and fled. They were not there. They were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to the happenings. All, I'm asking the Englishman, does all mean all in your language? He said, yes. I asked the Zulu in my country, does bonke mean bonke in your language? He said, yes. I said, you Africana, does almal mean almal in your language? He said, yes. Does kulli mean kulli in your language, you Arab? He said, yes. So that they were not there. That's what Mark tells us. So because their knowledge was from hearsay, they had heard about a man dead and buried for three days. They expect him to be stinking in his grave. So when you see such a man, naturally you are terrified. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they're thinking. They're thinking he's come back from the dead, resurrected. So he says, Unzuru ila yadaya varijalaya. Says, Behold my hands and my feet. Inni anahua that it is I myself. I'm the same fellow man, damn fools. What are you afraid of him for? Husuni wanzuru. Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him, and they believed not for joy. I'm only reading. And they believed not for joy, means that they were overjoyed and wondered, what happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, Have you here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broil fish and a honeycomb and he took it and he ate in the very sight. To prove what? That he's resurrected? To prove that you got flesh and bones? 
you eat food, what is he proving? That he is a spiritual body? Are they the needs of a spiritual body? Paul says, no. The resurrected body is spiritual. Jesus says, I'm physical. I'm asking the Englishman, because I understand English better than other languages, I say, please tell me, in your language, if somebody tells you that because I have flesh and bones, me, me, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? I said, because I have flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? He says, yes. I said, in other words, he's telling you that the body that you're seeing, it is not a translated body, it is not a metamorphosed body, it is not a resurrected body. Because you will be given a chance, because the resurrected body gets spiritualized. Who says so? I said, Paul. Who says so? I said, Jesus. Now you contradict them. Contradict Paul that, look, Paul, you got it all wrong. Now, Paul had a reason for believing that Jesus was resurrected spiritually. The reason is that he was on the Damascus road. He was persecuting the early Christian. And on the Damascus road, he sees a vision. Great light, and he hears a voice. In the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 7, chapter 22, verse 9, chapter 26, verse 14, you read there about this incident. In this vision, he sees a great light and he hears a voice calling him in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why kickest thyself against the pricks? Saul, Saul, that was his name. But of course, our Latinized brethren, the Greeks, they turned it into Paul. See, St. Paul's Cathedral, it should be St. Saul. Saul was his name, but you know, for complexes that people suffer from, subject people, they change Paul, Saul to Paul, they Simon, Kephas to Peter, you see? However, that is not the point here. The fact is, he say, tells us that the people that were with him, they heard the voice, but they didn't see anybody. So this was the vision that Paul had, either uh, hallucination or a genuine vision. I'm not contesting, a genuine vision. But it was intangible, it was spiritual, it was not physical meetings, so come on, shake my hands, and you can feel me that it's me. So no, no, no. It was something that was, he appeared, as he says, he appeared unto Peter, Paul testifies. Jesus appeared unto Peter. He appeared unto the twelve. He appeared unto the five hundred. He appeared to James. And last of all, he appeared unto me. Appeared, appeared, appeared. In other words, it's not a physical meeting. It is not a factual, solid meeting. It was not a tangible meeting. This was something that he saw spiritually and he imagined that what he had seen spiritually, all the others had similarly seen spiritually. So from that he concluded that Jesus died and was resurrected spiritually. And on that theme, the whole of the 14 books are based on a spiritual resurrection of Jesus, which Jesus Christ contradicts. Jesus himself, he contradicts that I am that same man, flesh and blood, handle me and see. I'm not what you are thinking. You're thinking I have come back from the dead. I'm resurrected. I'm not that. And we find that Jesus, it says that in the Bible, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verse 19, that he came. He just didn't appear in that upper room. He came, John 20, 19. This Then in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, again, the beloved Luke, the physician, he testifies. He says, Allazina arahum aidan nafsahu hayyan bi barahina kathiratin. And he showed himself to these people, and by proved by many convincing proofs, 
he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. A-L-I-V-E, alive. In Greek, uh, my brother Floyd Clark can confirm, the word there is zen, Z-E-N, zen, means alive. Not resurrected, the word is he's alive. Then in Mark chapter 16, verse 11, we read, and they had heard that he was alive, zen, Zedian Zin, alive, and had been seen by her, but they believed not. That Mary Magdalene saw him, but when she told, testified to the others, they believed not. What they didn't believe? That he was alive. Not they had seen the ghost of Jesus. If they had said that in the ghost of Jesus, she, anybody would have believed. Because in those days, you know, ghosts went into pigs. You remember 2,000 pigs were destroyed, one hit. The spirit went into the pigs, 2,000 pigs, they ran down the hill and they all got drowned. They saw spirits going into trees and drying them up. They found spirits still in storms. So spirit was not something unusual to them. But they're not talking about spirits. They say he, she said, that he is alive, and they believe not. There were two from Emmaus, when they returned to that upper room, and when they testified to the others, that he is alive, and they believe not. I'm only quoting. They are saying that he's alive. Mary Magdalene says he's alive. Luke says that he's alive. And our brethren, they say, no, he's resurrected. He's resurrected. I said, look, the word there is alive in your book, in every version. Jehovah's Witnesses, they say alive. Your Roman Catholic version says he's alive. Your King James version says he's alive. Your RSV says he's alive. There is not a Bible where the word there is resurrected. But the preaching is different. You see, the preacher preaches is he's resurrected. So they create a word, they concoct a word, and they thumbsuck it. It's, it's a, you know, it suits. It's very soothing. Instead of saying he's alive, they say he's resurrected. He's resurrected. But the scripture testifies again and again, the angels, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Luke chapter 24, verse 25. I'm sorry, 24, verse 23, that he's alive. Two men, Luke 24, 4 and 5, verse 4 and 5, said two men that stood by, where the sepulcher, told the women, why seek ye the living among the dead? You're looking for a live person in a mortuary or in a cemetery? What's wrong with you? He's alive. And in this book that's given to you tonight, more than 30 different reasons are given to you from the scriptures and from authorities that Jesus was alive, 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 alive. It's your privilege to take it home, read it, master it, and share this with your fellow Christian brethren and brothers and sisters. Now, Jesus Christ, he had already foretold. He had foretold what was going to happen. And the clearest, simplest prophecy you find in the Gospel of Saint, Ma uh, Saint Matthew, chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40, the Jews come to him again with another poser, another riddle. Another request. They say, Ya muallim nuridu an nara minka ayatan. I'm quoting this in Arabic, so my Arabic brethren might know that there is an Arabic Bible. They have 11 different versions for you, for the Arabs, 11 different versions, different dialects. You have no excuse whatsoever, the Arab. Get the Arabic Bible, master these, and talk to your Christian Arabs. In the Lebanon, in Egypt, talk to them. Here, I'm reading it from the Arabic Bible, so you may be able to catch it quicker than the English that I'm going to translate into. So, ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara minka ayatan. Said, Master, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle to convince us that you are the man we are waiting for, our Messiah. Fa'ajaba wa qala lahum. But he answered and said unto them, Jilun shirirun wa fasikun yatlubu ayatan. It's an evil and adulterous generation. Seek it after a sign. You want a mojiza, a miracle? What a horrible people you are. Can't you listen to what I'm talking? Uh, 
brother. you also will have a chance my brother brother you will also have the opportunity if you know arabic yeah. we will give you a chance you we will, will have give all you the opportunity please please we please, will give you a chance reading. you got the bible there open the bible matthew chapter 12 verse 38 39 40 <laughs> if you don't understand english see the arabic good good jesus says wala tu'ta lahu ayatun and there shall no sign be given unto it no mojiza illa ayata yunan nabi except the sign of the prophet jonah except the miracle of yunus alayhi salam li annahu kama kana yunanu fi batn al huti thalathata ayamin wa thalathata layalin for as jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale in the belly of the whale hakaza just like that hakaza just like that hakaza yakun ibn al insani so shall the son of man be fi batn al ard in the heart of the earth thalathata ayamin wa thalathata layalin for as jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth that's the only sign only miracle he said is prepared to give this evil and adulterous generation he had performed many miracles we muslims have no hesitation in accepting the miracles of jesus that he gave life to the dead by god's permission he healed, healed those born blind and the lepers by god's permission if you say he healed blind bartimus as a right i accept He says, "You know that woman with issues. She was bleeding for continuously for years. Jesus, you know, she touched the helm of Jesus and she was healed. He dried up the fig tree from the very roots. According to the scriptures, he killed those two thousand pigs. But now, whatever you say, I am prepared to accept. But here, he tells the Jews, no sign, no more jiza, except one." and that is the mujiza the sign the miracle of yunus alayhi salam they call him jonah so i am asking what was the sign of jonah what was his miracle to find that you have to go to the book of jonah and there is a book in the bible of some 66 books of the protestants and 73 of the roman catholics they have 73 books inside the bible In the 73 and the 66 books of the Protestants and the Catholics, there is a book. This is the book. I reproduced it. Page. I enlarged it. Book of Jonah. This is the book. Four short chapters. So you, it's a bit difficult, you know, for you to go along and look for a page. I made it easy for people in my meetings as ha. I give everybody the book of Jonah present because it's only one page, and it won't take you five minutes, two minutes to read this. but you don't have to go there every child jewish christian or muslim knows about the story of jonah jonah and the whale everybody knows the jew knows the christian knows and the muslim knows you you know salih salam and the fish who doesn't know so i said look if i repeat the story to you you will be able to confirm what i'm going to tell you now about jonah Jonah was sent to the Ninevites, a city of Nineveh, over a hundred thousand people. God Almighty commands him. He says, "Go to Nineveh and warn the people that they must repent in sackcloth and in ashes," meaning they must humble themselves before the Lord. But Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa, modern Jaffa. He goes to Joppa and he takes a boat and is running away. Why? Because he is despondent. He says, you know, these materialistic people, a wicked and adulterous generation of his time, a wicked and adulterous generation of his time, they will not hearken to the message. So he presumptuously runs away. He takes a boat, running away. At sea, there is a storm, and according to the superstitions of these people, anyone who runs away from his master's command creates such a turmoil at sea. So they begin to question. Who can be responsible? So Jonah realizes that as a prophet of God, he was a soldier of God, and as a soldier of God, he had no right to do things presumptuously. God says, "Go to Nineveh. You have to go to Nineveh." So he is the guilty party. 
he's running away from his master's command. So he tells the people, he says, look, I am the guilty man, and God Almighty is after my blood, and he wants to kill me, and in the process he'll sink the boat, and you innocent people will die. It'll be better for you if you take me and you throw me overboard. He makes a manly comeback. He's not a coward like you and me. Why should you innocent people suffer for my guilt? Throw me overboard, and it'll be all right for you. They say, look, man, you are such a good man. Perhaps, you know, praying up and down like us and, you know, beseeching God for help. I said, you are such a good man, such a holy man, such a pious man. Surely, you know, you couldn't be guilty of any such things. So they said, look, we have our own system of finding out right from wrong, which is called casting of lots, like head or tail, like throwing the dice. And according to that system, it came to the turn of Jonah, that Jonah was the guilty man. So they took him and they threw him overboard. I'm reading the book of Jonah. They threw him overboard. Now I'm asking you all the question. That when they threw Jonah overboard, was he dead or was he alive? But before you answer, this answer I want from you. But before you answer, I want to help you. I don't want you to make a mistake. You see, Jonah had volunteered. He says, throw me. So if a man volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You agree? If a man volunteers, you don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing him. Am I right? He volunteers, he says, throw me. If he resisted, it would be different. But it's not, he says, throw me. So when they threw him overboard, please answer me, all of you. Was he dead or was he alive? Alive. Beautiful. You get no price for that. It was a very easy question. <laughs> a fish comes and gobbles him. A fish gobbles him up. Dead or alive? Of course alive. From the fish's belly, he prays to God for help. Do dead people pray? Do they? No. So he was? A little louder? Alive. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. Third day, vomits on the seashore. Dead or alive? Alive. It's alive, alive, alive. It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. When you throw a man into a raging sea, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle. A fish gobbles a man, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly, whale's belly, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. If he didn't die, it's, it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. The man is surviving. Well, he, he ought to have been dead. So what did Jesus say? He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, in the belly of the whale. How was Jonah dead or alive? Alive. Please, please, please. Would you please, brothers, we don't like at all these emotional uh, gestures. Let the speaker continue his lecture. Inshallah. So, the answer is, the man is alive. Three days and three nights, he's alive, continuously. And Jesus said, for as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. What happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. Jonah is alive. I'm asking the Christian world, 1,200 million Christians. I'm asking them. Jesus in the tomb. Jesus in the sepulcher. For three days and three nights. Was he dead or was he alive? Dead. That's the right answer. Jesus is dead. Jonah is alive. Is that in your language, I'm asking, is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? In your language. In your English. I want to know Jonah is alive for three days and three nights. Jesus is dead for three days and three nights. In the Englishman's language, I want to know, very simple question, is that dead? Or is it alike or is it unlike? Unlike. What did Jesus say? He will be like Jonah, and the Christian will say he was unlike Jonah. So I am asking them, who is speaking the truth? You or Jesus?
This is, this is a natural reaction. This is, no, this is a natural reaction. If a person appreciates, right. you know, what is said, and if you don't respond, they might think that these are all dummies sitting here. You know, it's about, at times, you have to. So, you see my brother, my dear brothers and sisters, I am only reading the Christian scriptures as they are. I am not added, adding anything into them, nor am I taking anything out. I only show you, so look, this is what Jesus said, and this is how you find that instead of fulfilling the prophecy, this is being fulfilled in reverse. So the clever man, uh, we meet missionaries, they tell us, he says, no, 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 Mr. D, Dad. You see, Jesus was emphasizing the time factor. They say it was a time factor. You see, he uses the word three, four times. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. So he's emphasizing the time factor. I said, look, there is nothing miraculous about a time factor. Whether a man is in the tomb for three days, three hours, three years, three weeks, that is not a miracle. The miracle is that you expect a man to die and he doesn't die. That is a miracle. There's a no, 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 drowning men clutching at straws. Drowning women do the same. Somehow, now, I can't let go. Easy salvation you have got. You have earned easy salvation. Christ died for your sins. So, I said, now look, when was Christ crucified? So the whole Christian world tells me on Good Friday. In my country, we have a public holiday called Good Friday. In African, Hui Freida, Good Friday. The Mosutu people, Lesotho, they commemorate Good Friday. Zambia, Swaziland, every Christian nation, Britain, France, Germany, each and every Christian nation commemorates Good Friday. So I'm asking, what makes Good Friday good? It's a Christ died for our sins. So, he was crucified on a Good Friday. He said, yes. I said, morning or afternoon? <laughs> so, they say in the afternoon. I said, how long was he on the cross? Some say three hours, some say six hours. I won't argue. Whether you say three or you say six, I agree. I said, you know, the Jews were in a hurry to put him up on the cross. You know why? Because of the general public. This man, Jesus, was a hero to the masses, to the masses. He had fed, as our brother said just now, 5,000 people with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. Your reputation spreads. 5,000 people at the free food. Your reputation spreads. Another occasion, another 3,000 people. And he healed the blind and the lepers and he quickened the dead. A man with such a reputation, if his life was in danger, you'll find the whole nation might be aroused. There could be a rebellion. So, they felt that quick as possible, you know, we must get rid of the man, who Jesus. So they had a midnight trial, which doesn't happen in Jewry. They did it. Early in the morning, they take him to Pilate. Pilate says, not my kettle of fish, take him to Herod. Herod says, I'm not interested, take him back to Pilate. These things only happen in films, that in one hour, you can show the life of a man in one hour. It doesn't happen in real life. As if Pilate had nothing to do, he was sitting there waiting, and Herod had nothing to do, he was waiting, and when they returned back, he says, Pilate is still waiting, it doesn't happen in real life. But if you say it happened that way, I said, right, I agree. So quickly, quickly, quickly put him up on the cross, according to the scriptures. And we are told that they managed it. But as much as they, as they were in a hurry to put him up, they were also in a hurry to bring him down. You know why? Because of the Sabbath. Curious people, these Jews. They are in a hurry to put up the man, and now they are in a hurry to bring him down. Because of the religious scruples. You see, at sunset on Friday, the Sabbath starts. And they were told in the book of Deuteronomy, that they, must, they must see to it that nobody is hanging on the cross on the Sabbath day, that thy land may not defile with the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So, to fulfill that, down, down, down. And I am told they managed that also. And they gave him a burial bath like what we whistle and they put 100 pound weight of medicines around him and they put a winding cloth around him and they put him into the sepulcher not a grave big roomy chamber they put him in there so i'm asking by the time they put him in according to your story 
according to your book, it's already evening. And they agree. Because it takes two hours to give a bath and take about another two hours to put that ointment and put the wrapping. I said, it's already evening. So Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. He's supposed to be in the grave. Mark my words. And watch my finger. Can you see my finger? Yes. Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. So the Christian agrees. I said, Saturday day, he's still supposed to be in the grave. He said, yes. Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. This is right. Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, the tomb is empty. Is it right? The tomb is empty. How many nights and how many days? Look, before you answer, I want to make it easy for you. Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night. How many nights and how many days? <laughs> Two nights and a day. What did you say? For as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. I'm asking, does this look like that? <laughs> so failed again a second time. Look, what are you doing to this mighty messenger of God? These are the signs, the only sign he gave for his bona fide to say that I'm the Messiah. The only sign. Like me coming along, you know, claiming some crown jewels from your, you know, that castle, crown jewels. It was supposed to be given to me. They only want to verify that I'm Ahmad Didat. So I said, I'm Ahmad Didat. Those crown jewels were supposed to be given to me. You know, some will made out by King George IV, you see. In that, my name was there. So I said, those crown jewels. He said, you Ahmad Didat? I said, yes. He said, what's the proof? Oh, I said, I have my passport in my pocket, my identity. He said, yes. Can we have a look? So I show the person my identity. And in my identity, they see my photo with all this. But it's written there, you know, it's written there, Mr. Foster. It's written there, Mr. Bhutha. It's written there, Mr. Callaghan. Will they give me the parcel? No. I said, look, it's me. Look, it's me. He said, yes, but you said your passport, your passport, your photo, and your name. And that's the only thing I do. I said, look, you know, I, we had to do all this sort of thing. I had another reason. I said, oh, please don't waste my time. Please. You said you are Mr. d -Dat, and I wanted your identity. I see your picture all right, but the name is something else. I can't get the password. You agree? I can't get the password. Jesus Christ puts all his, his eggs in one basket. He said, the only sign I'm going to give you is that of Yunus Ali Salah. And the Christians say he failed twice. He failed twice in just fulfilling one prophecy. So if I was a Jew, if I was a Jew, I can't accept him as my Messiah. I said, the man, he gave the only proof he gave, and he failed twice. So if my people killed him, if they killed him 2,000 years ago, as he deserved it, the guy was an imposter, can't you see? But I, as a Muslim, I believe that he's a Messiah. The Quran testifies that he's a Messiah, the Masih. Masih who is Sabnu Maryama. Messiah, Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, we accept. But if I was a Jew, I would be forced to reject. I said, look, the man didn't even fulfill. fulfill. You know, the first one, he failed, and he fails again a second time. And you say he is a true man of God. So, you know, the, the Christian is in a predicament. But your learned men, you see, the Anglican bishops, the Anglican bishops, they have come to realize the fallacy of their beliefs. The Anglican bishops, look, I'm reading from one of my Sunday papers, one of my newspapers, Dateline from London. You know, one of your television people, they carried out a survey of the Anglican bishops, and I'm reading. It says more than half of England's Anglican bishops say Christians are not obliged to believe that Jesus was God. Finished. What was the difference? What was the fight all about between the Muslim and the Christian? The most fundamental thing that was dividing the Muslim and the Christian was the divinity of Christ. The Christians say that Jesus is God, and the Muslims say he's not God. And now, you can come along question time, I'll answer you.
see the Anglican bishops, more than 50%, they are telling the congregation that you don't have to believe. That means you can become a Muslim now. Look, that dividing line is removed. What is holding you back? Salvation. How do you get salvation? Christ dying for your sins, as, as a man or as a God. Did he die as a man or did he die as a God? If he, huh? if he died as a man, one man can't carry the sins of the world. Common sense. A lot of prophets died. Jesus says to the Jews, so you kill the prophets. From righteous Abel to Zechariah, you kill the prophets. In the verses that were read, it's the Jews, the impossible things that they were asking. This is, you know, they were asking the prophet miracles. He said they were asking for greater miracles from Moses. They wanted to see God face to face. These Jews, now, more than 50% of the bishops, paid servants of the Anglican Church, they are telling the congregation, Jesus, you don't have to believe. If you don't have to believe, this is join hands with us. That's what we're trying to tell you for 1,400 years. We were telling you, Lakat Kafaralas. The Quran says, Lakat Kafaralas in Akalu in Allah al Masih ibn Maryam. Whosoever says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, they are making kufr, it's an act of blasphemy against God. So, waqal al Masih, but Christ said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, La'budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Innahu man yushrik billah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, faqad haram Allah liya jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for them, wa ma'abahun nar, and the fire of hell will be the dwelling place, wa ma'alil zalimina min ansah. And for this. And for the wrongdoers, there will be no one to help. So our Christian Anglican brethren, they have given us a hand of friendship, of brotherhood. Take that hand. You see, we are asleep. We are sleeping. They are opening the doors for you and you are sleeping. Take that hand. They tell you further about the resurrection. You know, because without death and resurrection of Jesus, no Christianity. That's what Paul said. If Christ is not risen from the dead, he said, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. So the poll of 31 out of England's 39 bishops, that I worked it out, 70%, 70% of the bishops, Anglican bishops, shows that many of them think that Christ's miracles, the virgin birth and the resurrection might not have happened exactly as described in the Bible. It's all like fairy tales. All these are like fairy tales. 70% of the Anglican bishops are saying that now. 70%. I'm asking them. We say, Wama kataluhu, wama salabu. They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. So if they didn't kill and they didn't crucify, there's no resurrection. Whatever happened, there is no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. It's about time. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, let me as time is running out fast, let me end with another example from the Bible. You see, it was Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus. I'm reading the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19, 19, 20. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus. I'm asking, why did she go there? Why did she go there? The gospel say she went to anoint him. I say the Hebrew word for anoint is masaha. The Arabic also masaha, the root word, which means to rub, to massage, to anoint. Now tell me where the Jews massage dead bodies after three days, do they? The answer is no. We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew in our ceremonial law. Do Muslims massage dead bodies after three days? The answer is no. I said, you Christians, do you massage dead bodies after three days? The answer is no. Then I said, why would this woman want to go and massage a dead rotting body after three days? Because within three hours, within three hours, rigor mortis sets in. Rigor mortis sets in. Oh, See, brother this is the in Islam, now, this brother is the in Islam, I don't like anybody to respond. No response at all. Would you please keep quiet? 
Please, please. I know it hurts. No, I know it hurts. You see, because the foundation, the ground is being taken away from under your feet. And if you feel in desperation, I can appreciate that. By God, I appreciate your feelings. The thing... <laughs> Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and she finds the tomb empty. I'm asking why did she go there? So we are told she went to anoint him. When she finds the tomb empty, she starts to cry. It's a disappointment. She expected to find Jesus there. So she starts to cry. She sees the empty tomb and the winding sheets inside and the stone removed. So Jesus was watching her from wherever he was, not from heaven, but from this earth. You see, this tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich, influential disciple of Jesus, who had carved out of a rock a big roomy chamber, which Jim Bishop, one of your authorities, describes as five feet wide by seven feet high by 15 feet deep with a ledge or ledges inside. Around this tomb was the man's vegetable garden. Now don't tell me that this Jew was so generous, he was planting vegetables five miles out of Jerusalem for other people's sheep and gay goats to graze upon. Surely he must have got his gardener's quarters and perhaps his country home where he went for the weekend with his family. Jesus is there. He sees this woman, he knows who she is and he knows why she is there. So he walks up to her and he finds her crying. So he says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Why are you crying for? Who are you looking for? I am asking, why does he ask such a silly question? Doesn't he know who she is looking for? Doesn't he know that she is disappointed not finding him? Of course he knows. Then why is he asking such a silly question? I say, it is not a silly question. He is actually pulling her leg, as the Englishman says, you know, metaphorically. Playing the fools. He has still got the sense of humor. He has been through an ordeal, according to the scriptures, but he's still got the sense of humor. So he says, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener. I said, why does she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? Then why does she suppose he's a gardener? I said, because he's disguised as a gardener. Why is he disguised as a gardener? I said, because he's afraid of the Jews. Why is he afraid of the Jews? Because I say he didn't die and he didn't conquer death. Because if he had died and if he had conquered death, there's no need to be afraid anymore. Why not? Because the resurrected bodies can't die twice. Who says so? I said the Bible. What does it say? It says it is ordained unto all men once to die and after that the judgment. You can't die twice. So she, supposing him to be the gardener, says, Sir, if you have taken him hence, tell me, where have you laid him? to rest, to relax, to recuperate, so that I might take him away. One woman carrying away a corpse. Can you imagine? A frail Jewess, like a super American woman, you know, the super women's type of woman, you know, carrying him like a bundle of straw and take him away, bury him as a hood like the grave. If there was a grave, carrying is one thing, but burying means she just have to dump him in a hole. Does it make sense? No. So she's supposing him to the gardener, says, Sir, if you have taken him hence, tell me, where have you laid him? To rest, to relax, to recuperate, so that I might alone might take him away. The joke has gone too far. So Jesus says, Mary, the way he said, Mary, she recognized that this is Jesus from this intonation. And she wanted to grab him, as the Jews would do, to pay respects. So he says, touch me not. I say, why not? Is he a bundle of electricity, a dynamo, that if she touches him, she'll get electrocuted? No. Then why not? I say, because it hurts. What other reason? It hurts. You go and grab a man who has been through an ordeal, as Brother Floyd Clark described, you know, the nails and flogging and all that, and you go and embrace him, you're going to kill him. So she says, Mary, says, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my father. I am not yet ascended unto my father. In other, in the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he's saying, I'm not dead yet. Now, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my brother Floyd Clark has been unjust to himself. See, I feel he was unjust to himself. 
because this format was made by me. I said, whoever speaks first gets 10 minutes in the end. The second speaker has one hour continuously. The choice is yours. You take the choice. Had he given me the choice of speaking first, he would have an opportunity of refuting each and every one of these. But now, I, I, I pity him in 10 minutes now, what, what he's going to do? What he's going to ent disentangle? What has been entangled now? What has been proved? What, what is, I, I pity my brother, you know, good friend, I love him. But I said, now you have been, if you had asked for my advice, I would have told you, let me speak first. So you have an hour to refute me, and then I can rebut him if, if it was possible. But uh, there is a verdict is required from each and every one that is here tonight. It is not a question of who is right and who is wrong. You can see where truth lies. What the Muslim says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ That they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. And crucify means to kill by hanging or impaling on the cross. And you say, whatever things happen, according to your records, this, he was not killed and he was not crucified. And the verdict is that if the Jews were in the dock for the murder of Jesus Christ, that they are not guilty for attempted murder, yes, but not for murder. Uh, before I introduce uh, Professor Floyd again for the uh, 10 minutes, I would like to make an appeal for both Muslim and Christian audience and say this, it may be useful and important to think, it may be useful to interact or have information or intellectual thinking, but it is just as important to manifest the noble and lofty teaching of both Christ and Muhammad, peace be upon them, in our own behaviors. So I would ask the Muslim audience never to interrupt Professor Floyd or inject anything from the floor as he presented his full piece in the beginning. And I would ask my Christian brethren to observe the same also during the question and answer period. Thank you. Professor Floyd. I hope that you will accede to the request of our chairman I really am embarrassed because uh, there was no interruption whatever of my speaking and I know most of the audience are not fully in accord with what I said. And uh, I hope that you will give to Mr. Didat the courtesy that you gave to me. As uh, <clears throat> Uh, Brother Didat was sharing with us his study of the scriptures. I'm delighted that he's studying 1 Corinthians 15, just praying that the light one day will break. <laughs> there are three or four points. Now, uh, I'm not here to debate. Mr. Didat invited me to this program, and I was concurring with him. We're not here to do battle with one another, but... Uh, this was his request. He said, uh, we want to talk about the Bible. You do the best you can do, I'll do the best we can do, and then we'll leave it to God as to what happens. I believe that a wise choice. I appreciate the courtesy extended. I would invite my friend to further study First of all, in the matter of reference to Mary touching Jesus, uh, Brother Ahmed, you need to check back with your Greek. The word hapto, the word to touch used in that text, has one meaning in the active voice and another meaning in the middle. In the active, it means to touch, as Brother Ahmed was talking about. But in the middle, it means to cling, and it is used in 1 Corinthians 7 of the embrace of people in a marriage relationship. Mary had grabbed him around the knees and was clinging to him to keep him. And Jesus said, you do, do not cling to me. 
I have not yet ascended unto my Father. I am fully in accord with all that Brother Ahmed said about Jesus coming back alive from the dead. Everything he says is true. Jesus was alive in the body and manifest being alive in the body in all of his appearances following the crucifixion. But what Brother Ahmed still does not understand is that when Jesus said flesh and bones, he did not say flesh and blood. He gave his blood when he died upon the cross, and he did not miraculously receive it back. He came into the upper room in a bloodless body, evidenced by the fact that the holes in his hands and feet and side were not oozing blood out on the carpets. In the distinction between the alive and the resurrection, Brother Ahmad needs to study further this point. Jesus said that he would lay down his life, he would take it again, and he would do it, and he would come back and be with him, which he did. But 40 days afterwards, he ascended leaving the physical body behind and ascending in the resurrected body. In Jesus' case, occurring 40 days after the crucifixion, and in his words to Mary, as quoted by Ahmed, I have not yet ascended. In the discussions which we have had about the sign of Jonah, Ahmed needs to look further into the text also. When Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the earth, the Greek word is there, hosper, as indeed. It does not express a comparison of identical nature. It is comparing some loose sense of comparison. Had the author intended an exact relationship, he would have needed to use hosautos or some such conjunctive adverb. As to the three days and three nights, Christendom did not celebrate Good Friday for more than 300 years after the coming of Christ when many traditions crept in that were foreign to the New Testament. The New Testament teaches that there were two Sabbaths, a high Sabbath and a Sabbath a week co-joining, and that Jesus was crucified then on Thursday, not Friday, and his body lay in the tomb over the two days of the Sabbath. Again, I want to thank you for your wonderful courtesy. God bless you everyone. Thank you. While uh, I begin with some remarks as to how we should conduct the uh, question answer session, I would like to ask those who wish to have questions to line up in the front here so that they can use the microphone. Now, uh, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. I understand that this is a very limited time, so I would have to be, with your permission, very strict on these rules. First of all, a question is a question, is not a speech or mini-speech. You have only a few seconds to put your question directly and to the point. Number two, if any of your, the audience have more than one question, ask only one so as to give a chance to other brethren and get back to the, in the queue uh, you may have a chance if there is time allowed. Uh, I would like again to appeal to all audience never to interject anything from the floor or comment. Let people ask their questions briefly and the speakers will answer them. Again, I'd like to insist on that a few seconds. No preliminary comments. 
No preliminary comments. Directly to the question. The first brother, please. Uh, I'd like to ask both speakers why they didn't mention the, the fact that there are 49 references to crucifixion in the New Bible and to the word raised or resurrection in Arabic Qama in all languages there are more than seven references in front of me to the actual word being raised and why uh, they didn't refer both of them to the fact that external evidences in history has spoken about the actual crucifixion of Christ by the Roman authorities. Thank you. Would uh, any of the speakers wish to answer first? Yes. With regards to the, the word risen or resurrected in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, not once is the word resurrection used in connection with Jesus that he is resurrected. Not once. In the four Gospels, there is not a single reference. Uh, in, uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Dilad. No, no interjection. Please, please get back in the line and you may have a chance if there is... No, we have to give... Just a minute, please. We have to look at behind you and see how many people are waiting. Please give a chance to others. Would Professor Floyd wish to comment on that? Briefly also, please. Please. No, Yaakhi, you're not uh, the chairman of the meeting. I will tell him. So please, keep quiet. Uh, you wait for, until Professor Floyd answers. No, go ahead. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I heard the question with the disturbance involved, but if I understand the question, it is about the use of the word resurrection. And, uh, of course, the Bible r refers both to the fact that Jesus arose on Istami and uh, they, that he was alive. And uh, uh, this is the teaching of Scripture, that uh, Jesus was resurrected and Jesus was alive. Thank you, Professor Floyd. The next uh, questioner. This question is uh, to either uh, Professor Floyd or uh, Mr. Dida. Can you get a bit close to the mic so that Sorry. everybody can hear you? The question is for both speakers, really. Okay. It may sound a bit irrelevant, but I'm very anxious to know if Jesus uh, has said anything about the coming of Muhammad, please. That's in the Bible you are or, or. The Sorry. Okay, uh, the question uh, is whether Jesus said anything about the coming of Muhammad. Uh, in the chair, I would like to rule that this is not uh, relevant to the specific topic for tonight. If there is a chance after the questions are answered, we might be able to get to that. Thank you. The next. I understand from Professor Clark's lecture that Jesus Christ gave his life for the sins of humanity and also that uh, the death is the sort of penalty of sins. If that is true, that simply means that the, that the concept of reward and the concept of punishment is lost then you can go on committing the sin and there's nothing to stop it from you. Okay, you, uh, your question is directed is question? to any of... Professor Patricia? Clark, please. To Mr. Didat. To Professor? Professor. Would you repeat it? I'm not hearing. I didn't hear it. Would you repeat it but provide, please, come to the point, straightforward. The, the Brief. point said too, you see, from Professor Clark's lecture, I understand that Jesus Christ gave his life for the sins of humanity. Mm -hmm. And the second point is that the death is sort of penalty of sins. Therefore, it implies that you can keep on committing sins and nothing to stop it from you because the concept of reward and punishment is completely lost if we believe in this thing. Okay. I think Again, we're having difficulty. I'm uh, uh, old enough to, in this sort of thing, not to be able to pick up all that is being said, but if I understand the question, the question is, if Jesus died for the sin of the world, does that encourage everybody to sin? Is that the question? Well, we have the definitive answer, of course, in Romans. That's impossible because if a Christian obeys the Lord Jesus Christ, 
uh, uh, and uh, is pardoned for his sins, the Christian dies to sin. Uh, we are buried, therefore, Paul says, with baptism through him into death, that Christ, like as Christ was raised from the dead, and, and so on. And the Christian cannot continue in sin if he accepts the uh, blood of Christ because he dies to sinning, and that's why he comes to him. Thank you. The next, and again briefly and to the point. This is the Professor Clark. Um, I refer to Matthew 27, verse 46, 47. The statement reads, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And then further on it says, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? One, just one thing. Um, it's the only verse that is left in the original Armenic uh, or Greek. Now, that is why it intrigues me. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. The word in Greek the for point, God, yeah. yes, is Elohim. There is no such God and there is no proof anywhere that in that time, in the time of Jesus, that Eli meant my God. Because why did uh, the Jews... Uh, excuse me. No speeches, no many speeches, no preliminary remarks. Okay. Put the question directly. Okay. The question is, then it goes on to say, then some of the bystanders hear the, uh, hearing this said, what is this man saying? Is he meaning Elijah? That means the Jews did not understand what Eli meant. Again, I have to warn you before cutting what you off. Is the question? Put your question directly in one sentence. Okay. What is the question? The question is, my proposition is Eli does not mean my God. Eli is a name because I've asked synagogues and I've asked several professors of okay. Hebrew and they say Eli can be a, God, a name okay. of a person. Okay, Professor Clark. Again, I think the question is uh, difficult in this context to answer. Jesus is quoting uh, from an Old Testament passage, and uh, in uh, that Old Testament passage, we then can understand what Jesus was talking about. And I would recommend that the party who has the question just turn to that passage in the Old Testament, and I think it perfectly answers your question. Thank you. The next questioner. I hope there will be no need to cut off any questioner. Please. Um, I first would like to thank uh, Mr. Didet for his very excellent and intelligent exposition of the question. And now the I'd question. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Clark, um, about what he thinks of the uh, nature of Jesus and uh, whether he was God or the son of God or the messenger of God. Because in his talk, he said that um, when Jesus was um, about to bring Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead, he said, thank you um, so that you may believe, so that they may believe that you have sent me. He's talking to God. So, okay. And also, uh, on the cross, in Professor Clark's exposition, he's saying, Father, in thy hands I commit my soul. Now, oh. isn't that enough evidence for Professor Clark to convince him that the relationship between Jesus and God is the relationship between a God and a messenger? Okay, thank you. The question was directed to Mr. Didet or to Professor Clark. Just make it clear. Okay. Jesus, when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he was speaking in the spirit of all that he had done through a long time ministry in which he said he did nothing except what he saw his father do, that the words he spoke were not his own, but the words he heard his father speak, and he claimed only to be uh, uh, relating uh, to God as his father. Okay. Thank you. We're really running out of time. We might allow two or three questions more. The first one. In 1974-75 on television, Professor Anderson, who ironically taught Mohammedan law in the Council of Legal Education in London, and University of London called Muslim... Uh, brother, would you please put your question directly? It is. Yeah. And pagan, because they did not believe in Trinity. May I ask Dr. Floyd what is his view about Muslims, as they do not believe and recognize... Trinity, as well as the crucifixion of Prophet Jesus. 
do you consider Muslims as pagan or the people of the book, given also the fact that at the time of the Prophet, many pious Christians freely accepted Islam? Okay, thank you. Professor Clark. Well, it really doesn't matter what I think, it just matters what the book says. And uh, as we've been looking in the book, I think we can uh, come to whatever private opinions we may have. But I think of my brother Ahmed, as of one uh, whom in the New Testament was mentioned, as one who was not far from the kingdom. Okay, the next uh, question. The, the ne no injection from the floor, please. The next speaker. Would you please come close so that you could be... Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa uh, My question is direct to Brother Ahmad Didar. Well, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, on Friday, I, I attended his meeting in, in South Hall, and he was speaking about Prophet Muhammad's arrival is mentioned in the, in the Bible. Therefore, why Christians, theologists, don't talk about uh, if your question, I'm sorry for uh, injection here. If your question, brother, relate. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Listen, Just a minute, Prophet please. Muhammad's arrival is mentioned in the, uh, in the Bible. In fairness to you. Why Christian theologists don't talk about him? Just a minute, please. In fairness to you and to everybody else and to the brother who was turned down, the question is not relevant to the topic. Would you please uh, move on? Would you please move on and let the next speaker ask the question? Relevant to the topic? Go ahead briefly. Just put it. Uh, Professor Clark. Okay, would you. Thank you for your question. I drew the question out of order. It's not relevant to the topic. Would you move on, please? Would you move on? Would you move on, Jazakallah? Next speaker. Talk about this man. Billy Graham. Sorry. Uh, would the next speaker please ask his question? We have to be fair and firm. Am I doing something wrong? I'd like to get indication of the way I'm conducting questions. Am I unfair? <laughs> Go ahead. Briefly, brother, please. I would like to say that I'm grateful for this opportunity, and my questions are actually two. Number one, if the Quran is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says, okay. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died, and he rose again. The second question, if God... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The rules, the rules of the game is to ask one question and get the back so that other people will have a chance. Right. Thank you. Now, the question is directed to Mr. Didat. Mr. Right. Didat. Thank you. The verse in question is Wassalamu alayya yawma wulittu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubasu hayya which translated means so peace is on me the day that I was born the day that I die and the day that I shall be raised to life again the day that I die it is not the day that I died it's not died it's in the future uh, we have uh, we have time for a maximum or, of two or three questions at most because there is a few minutes at the end for concluding remark. Yes. The next question, please. If we admit, can, can you get close to the mic, please? If we admit that Jesus died to expiate sin, what was the cause handed to Adam for committing sin? Is it not that women would bring forth with pain and men would have to work for the bread? And is that finished in this world? Does the crucifixion help it? The next question I would like... No, no next question. No next question. Thank you. Uh, Professor Floyd, uh, Clark, Anyone? have you got the question? Sorry. Sorry. But I have one Sorry. Question. We have to respect the rules. Yes, the question one. of the brother... Uh, Only one question, please. I yeah. have one question. No, question. no second question. Please get in the back if there is a chance. Thank you. Uh, please keep the quiet. Keep the order. Keep the order, please. Wait a minute until the question is answered. Professor Clark. I 
understand. I'm not sure I understand the question. Did you get it? Um, what was the topic? I, I remember if you tell Something me. Something about sinning. And oh, yeah. He said, he said that if Jesus died for our sin, and the yes. Bible said that out because of that original sin, man was destined to labor for his work in the book of Genesis, and woman would suffer the pregnancy and childbirth. What, how, does, how is that consistent then? If Jesus died for our sin, and still women are going through this suffering, and men are working for this suffering. <clears throat> well, I think the question that has been asked concerning the role of the uh, <clears throat> woman who has been suffering since uh, the story, uh, since the beginning when Adam and Eve fell, and the woman has had this uh, role of uh, punishment because uh, she uh, disobeyed God. I, I think that question is very far from the, our discussion tonight, but in answer to this, uh, we do know that the New Testament teaches that all creation was brought under bondage when man sinned, and that bondage will not be redeemed until the end when Christ redeems the world. I think we'll have uh, entertain one more question because that we are running out of time. We have only four minutes left. The last one. Everybody has a question that is one sentence, but we have 50 sentences waiting. I Go like, ahead. I, I like to ask uh, Bruce, uh, Professor Clark in the book of Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong prayers and tears unto him, is God, that was able to save him from death? D-E-A-T-H, and was heard, and that was he feared. Wasn't a clear indication that he was saved from this? Thank you very much. Before the answer of the question, I have to apologize by asking the brothers or sisters who are waiting in line to forget it. And we are sorry, we are already 10 minutes behind time. There are concluding remarks, so we can't, we can't take that. Would you please, would you, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, could I ask those uh, brothers who are sta standing here to please be seated? There is no more time. <clears throat> Professor Clark. The, uh, the Hebrew writer makes it quite clear that Jesus came as a man into the world to live as a man and to learn obedience. And though he was God's prophet in the world and God's son, yet there were things that he had to do common to man and that he had to learn what it means as a man to have to obey. And in the midst of that, God heard him because of his faithfulness in a, a human flesh as he was laboring with the, the uh, temptations and, and the tortures and the uh, uh, hatred that he received in the world. And God, of course, heard him because he was faithful in everything which he did. Thank you. We come now to... We come now to some uh, concluding remarks and announcements. Uh, would you please allow me to continue? Thank you. Tonight, we have already heard two very prominent, very sincere speakers. I know it is July, but when you add the heat of July to the heat generated in this hall, it might get a little bit too much. However, I feel that uh, I am echoing the feeling of the great majority of those who are present that it is indeed quite useful and beneficial for both Muslims and Christians to get together and to try to understand each other. Muslims and Christians, the Muslims and Christians together with nearly one billion more or less followers each constitute about 40% of world population. It is indeed very strange that we hear about detente between such divergent philosophies as the US and the Soviet Russia. And we never hear as much about badly needed detente 
between two communities of believers who share something much more significant than those shared by the US and USSR. The belief in the creators, the belief in the prophets and revelation, in the moral laws, and on the responsibility for our life and in the life hereafter. I do invite the Muslim audience who are here to have to try sincerely to understand the standpoint of our Christian brethren. They are free, of course, to read the Quran and see what the Quran, the word of Allah, in their belief say about Jesus. But they must also try to understand Christianity from the standpoint and the way Christians understand it. But I'd like also to invite the Christian brothers and sisters sitting with us here to also have a sincere attempt to understand the teachings of Islam from its pristine sources. One scholar once commented that until relatively recently, 95% of the books written about Islam has been written by non-Muslims, mostly missionary or orientalists. And he addressed, he's a good friend of mine, her, uh, Reverend Harry Armand, when he quoted this, he addressed the Christian audience and said, what is your feeling as a Christian if 95% of the books written about Christianity are written by Muslims? As such, I hope that the least that can be done would be to refer to the Quran, which is the revelation the Muslim believe is to be the word of God. In fact, there is, can you get me a copy of the Quran? Uh, I was told that outside here in the souvenir shop, there are copies available of the translation of the meaning of the Quran by Yusuf Ali. It is, uh, the brother will show it to you, and I understand it is available for us. Also, a notice that uh, the tour of Mr. Didat will continue until the end of July, so you may inquire about further functions if you wish. Also, there is an announcement I was requested to make on behalf of uh, Dr. Clark that those who wish to discuss with him understand Muslims or non-Muslims who wish to ask him questions or queries should contact him after uh, the presentation. Uh, on Monday, July the 8th, there is another function he, on Christ in Islam at 7, 7 or 1 p.m.? At 7 p.m. in Southampton in the Civic uh, Center. And there's also additional information for those uh, who Dr. wish Badawi. to obtain them. Dr. Badawi, you don't mention where the venue of the Dr. Clark. Uh, you can meet Dr. Clark. No, no, no. That, oh, the venue right. for, uh, yeah, for Dr. Clark, those who wish to meet with him, they can meet in the lower level in the West Arena room below entrance number one. I wonder if there's any other announcement so that we can conclude. There, any? Is, tea. there is tea and the coffee. Everybody. There is tea and coffee so that you can cool down a little bit. And uh, in conclusion, any in other announcement? This video, it can be by direct. There are also direct. some videotapes of Mr. Didat's uh, presentations and dialogues which are available so you can inquire from the organizers after the meeting. Yes, Again, I would like to apologize for the brothers whom I cut off even though I didn't want to do it. I apologize to all of you. If there is any error, I, for, I seek forgiveness of Allah for that. And I thank you most earnestly, as well as our honored speakers, for your patience. Thank you very much. Quran uh, is indeed from God. Does it contradict itself in as much as it says? Okay. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died, and he rose again. The second question. If God oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry.